All right, and we are live. So welcome back to DAP University. So today we've got a lot to talk about in our live stream today. Okay, if anybody's been checking their crypto markets, they might be saying like, hey, what happened over the past 24 hours? We've got Bitcoin up over 10%. Uh, lots of other cryptos uh, look like they're uh, showing some signs of life. Okay, this is really uh, welcome price action after everything that we've seen over the past, you know, three months and change of just this relentless bearishness, all the uncertainty that's going on in the world world right now. Um, it's just been absolutely crazy. And here we have this big, uh, you know, change and trend, at least in the short term. So we're going to talk about that. Um, what, what we're seeing uh, in the marketplace, what some, you know, narratives are that are floating around about crypto and Bitcoin right now, what could actually be happening underneath with the fundamentals of this technology of the cryptocurrencies themselves. So uh, we're talking about that. We're looking at the uh, news updates that have happened in the space since yesterday, answer some of your questions and a lot more. So if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory and on this channel, I train into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to master blockchain step-by-step -step, start to finish, then head on over to adaptuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. Last but not least, like nothing, I'm saying this video is so be financial advice and there's lots of scammers on the comment section below. Just ignore them like I'm never going to give you my phone number on YouTube, never going to ask you to invest with me. It's absolutely crazy. Never going to DM you on a social network. I'm um, trying to get you to pay me to advertise and videos or something like that for crypto. So we got people jumping in the chat here. We've got um, uh, Automatic Beats, uh, Quinn, uh, Machiavelli. Uh, let's see here. Um, Lee, uh, Crypto Cows, Chris, uh, Patrick, Susanna, uh, Cash, or Kosh, hope I'm saying that right. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, so let's jump into this. Uh, I'm going to pull this up on my screen here. So. Um, We've seen a, we, we've seen Bitcoin up over 10% over the past 24 hours. Okay, actually, let me pull up my better orientation on my screen here. Uh, I've seen Bitcoin up uh, over 10% in the past 24 hours, and lots of other cryptos do the same, okay, um, or, or some even more, actually. Um, we're, when you look at this chart here, you know, we see that relentless bearishness that I'm talking about, and then all of a sudden we have this massive green candle, all right, that's kind of popping out of nowhere, all right? This, is, this has got a lot of people unexpected, and, you know, a lot of times in crypto markets, you have to think about what, what are people not expecting? Like, what the, like, the thing that might actually happen might be the thing that people are not expecting. That's kind of what happened when we changed trend here, <laughs> okay? That's kind of what happened when we changed trend here. Um, and likewise, I remember when we were here at this, you know, sort of bottom over the past summer, that this kind of started out as a disbelief rally, right? And we started to kind of make new highs and we ultimately printed a new high on Bitcoin, Ether, and also other assets as well. So what could be happening underneath underneath this, right? What could be fundamentally changing? Um, well, I'll pull this article here that was actually from Bloomberg, Okay, uh, that just popped up. So they're saying, you know, Bitcoin advances in tentative comeback as haven asset. So uh, we got a lot of crazy stuff going on in the world right now, right? I don't think I really need to belabor that point uh, for anybody who's been watching the news at all. We talked about some on our live stream yesterday, of course, the events in, uh, you know, in Europe right now. Um, want to be very sensitive to everything that's happening in that space. Um, you know, I personally know people on the ground who are affected by this stuff. So, you know, I'll be very, very careful at how I talk about that. Uh, but yesterday we did talk about how, you know, we're seeing the utility value of crypto actually shine in some of these uh, cases, right? Like I said, don't, don't, not trying to make an opportunity out of a bad situation, but sometimes you have to go through this stuff um, to actually, you know, click and see why something is important in the first place. When you feel pain, like you feel the pain, you see the problem, and then the solution is presented in a clear way that's just like, oh, you know, that that's why we need this stuff. And so we've seen that, like people have not had access to money, um, all that type of stuff. And crypto has helped that. All right. Um, but what's what else is going on in the world right now? Right. Uh, we're seeing, you know, currencies get devalued overnight. The ruble lost like I, I can't remember what it was, like 25 percent or something like that overnight. Um, we're looking at, you know, what's happening with the U.S. dollar. We're seeing, you know, the uncertainty with inflation across you know, really the globe. OK, we're seeing. Um, you know, worrisome policies, you know, but people worry about what's going to happen with interest rates, the Federal Reserve, Central Bank of the United States, all this type of stuff. And um, one potentially, 
um, attractive asset of, of Bitcoin in particular and other cryptos it, are safe haven assets and these types of things. We saw a narrative for that from Bitcoin you know, in its past, you know, people were trying to figure out what do we use Bitcoin for? And one compelling use case is this digital store of value. And can that value, can that store of value actually be a safe haven in uncertain economic times when the world itself is volatile, um, when, you know, capital needs to be preserved? Um, can it actually be a digital gold? Can it be something like that? And so that's what kind of, that's, that's one possibility of what's happening underneath the scenes here uh, or behind the scenes here um, as, you know, the world seems like it's it's going crazy, but we're seeing crypto, you know, print a 10% candle in a day. So let's kind of dive in that more. So Bitcoin advances intended to come back as safe haven as, you know, keyword tentative. We don't exactly know what's going to happen with this. This could be, um, this is not where I'm just saying that like this candle means, okay, we're off to the races and it's it's moon time from here. But let's, let's look at some of the other comments. So basically, um, you know, it rose 4.3% at 10.30 a.m. in London, okay, et cetera, et cetera. We did talk about, you know, how it gained 10% uh, in a day. So here's 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 the important part that I want to highlight. So Bitcoin's performance amid the volatility has some bulls pointing to a break from the narrative as crypto, crypto is just another risk asset. And that's what, we, that's what we're trying to highlight with this, is people treat, you know, all of crypto sort of like tech stocks or any other high-risk asset that seems somewhat correlated with another. What they're saying here um, said Bitcoin could de-link from risk, all right, the sort of risk basket of assets people talk about, and start trading more like a hedge to uh, geopolitical instability and inflation. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Like all the factors in the world right now uh, that make it kind of a scary, uncertain time. That um, you know we could de-link from the risky side of things and, and treat that more as a, as a safer uh, store of value, a hedge. So Bitcoin caused significant upward move today as it appeared to have slightly regained its safe haven status while Russia-Ukraine conflict continues to intensify. Okay, so trading volumes in Bitcoin using the ruble have surged to the highest level since May. It's exactly what I was talking about before. When you see your own national currency, um, you know, lose its value by, <laughs> I can't remember what it was, 25%, something like that overnight, uh, you want to put your dollar somewhere. And we're seeing here, um, you know, the exchange pair from ruble to, to Bitcoin, highest level since May, all right, suggesting Russians are potentially moving their money into crypto as the ruble plunges to a record low. All right, so um, Bitcoin's correlation, uh, while it's still elevated, the correlation to S&P 500 uh, has come up after rising 0.7 earlier this year, okay? Um, yeah, it's absolutely crazy. So, this is a is a possible uh, catalyst for um, you know continued forward momentum in in the crypto space and the crypto markets themselves, actual value of cryptocurrencies themselves, um, despite you know kind of the uncertainty of what's happening here. Now, we're very clear. I'm not saying that. Um, oh, sorry, I'm logged out of Trading View. Hold on a second. Let me log in. Uh, I want to log in on screen here. Um, We'll just go different chart here. Very clear. We're not saying that like, you know, Bitcoin's just off to the races that we're just going to moon from here. Okay. Um, but it, it does in the very least, in my mind, it's, it's a good sign that, you know, the massive like crypto winter um, that everybody I think is really scared about with all this uncertainty that's happening. Um it just got less likely in my opinion. Okay. That's not financial advice. I'm not saying just like, you know, buy the dip or we're going to moon from here. If you're totally safe, I'm not telling you what to do at all by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but to me, that scenario just got less likely. So you get to think about the crypto markets. You always have to think about what's likely, you know, what's the least likely scenario that all of crypto just goes to zero. That's probably not going to happen. Right. And like, um, that's on the on the downside. On the upside, what's the least likely thing that that Bitcoin's going to like you know a million dollars tomorrow? Like that's probably not going to happen either, right? So you have to kind of rank what the likelihood is in there somewhere in between. Um, the likelihood that we print new highs in 2022 just got more likely in my opinion. The likelihood that you know we are not going to go into some crazy, insane crypto winter that everybody thinks that we are um, just got you know that that the likelihood that we're not going to do that just got, you know, likelier in my opinion. So let me know what y'all think down in the comment section below. Um, 
Are you bullish? Are you bearish? Is this a massive fake out? Let's see here. So, do we have anybody? Um, and also, anybody's watching the streams um, who is like connected to anybody on the ground, or if you're on the ground yourself, you know, let us know. Are you safe? Hope everybody's doing okay. Um, we definitely want to keep connected to anybody who potentially needs help in this situation. So I do see this in the, in the comments say, say I'm concerned about the crypto community allowing uh, being okay with blockchain or sorry, with, with blocking Russian investors through exchanges I see as an attack on decentralization movement, which Web3 is all about. Um, so a lot of that really has got to centralized exchanges and there's not a whole lot that's that's Web 3.0 about centralized exchanges in the first place. Um, they're just custodians of cryptocurrencies themselves. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, you know, there's there's just not really a lot, like there's not a lot you can do about it. You know what I mean? You, in order to get that benefit of censorship resistant technology, like the technology itself actually has to be censorship resistant, and a centralized exchange just isn't. What I thought was striking was the um, CEO of Kraken was actually advising everybody um, if they cared about decentralization to actually take their assets off of the exchange and move them to a self-custodial wallet. Um, just to back your point up that like centralized exchanges are definitely like a decentralization weakness. Um, even yeah. the CEO of Kraken agrees. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean it's like hypocritical or anything like that. It's just, it means, and I don't think centralized exchanges are bad. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't think that, um, you know, we need a way for people, for most people with common sense to just buy crypto, um, and get on into the crypto space at, in the very least, you know, they can get out if they want to, they don't have to get out. Um, but the, at the very least it's one of the best on ramps that we have to get into, uh, cryptos it's just to trade dollars for, or whatever your fiat currency is for, um, or whatever kind of currency you have, um, for crypto. All right, so um, let's actually look at a couple of things that have happened in the space. Again, I really want to keep an eye on what's going on. Um, but, you know, when Bitcoin moves 10% in a day like that, um, you cannot ignore that. <laughs> okay. Um, that's not usually the type of thing that happens whenever. Um, that's not usually the type of thing that happens in the middle of a wintry, you know, a wintry time. So actually, I'm gonna pull this chart back up on my screen here. Okay. Um, so yeah, we've seen similar types of moves, um, you know, like here that kind of marked our bottom. I don't know. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not saying we have definitely bottomed, um, but yeah, it's it's encouraging. I mean, if you look back in the previous history, like, I don't really see. That type of movement. I mean, this this is also on the weekly chart, so I had to pull up daily. Yeah, you don't really, you don't really see that type of thing. Um, so yeah, let's look at let's look at a couple of things that have happened in this space. So this is one that uh, was from a couple of days ago, but I want to talk about it because you know gaming is a huge part of the crypto space. Um, uh, well, I'm going to have Walshy kind of give us all the details on this, but apparently Microsoft's uh, Minecraft goes Web3 with NFT worlds on Polygon. So NFT worlds. I'm going to let Walshy explain all the details on this one. Yeah, this is a super exciting. Um, so as you can tell, the title, uh, Minecraft has entered Web3. Um, it's called NFT worlds. But let's just not get this confused because this is actually not on a main Minecraft server. So there's two unaffiliated Microsoft developers, uh, like I said, have utilized third-party servers. They set up an in-game shop that's allowing players to connect to Polygon, again, the side chain to Ethereum, where they can go ahead and purchase in-game items using the token world. Um, there's a pretty cool video on Twitter, which actually shows them in-game um, and then going to like the actual you know shop and the interface and utilizing the interface to buy like an Apple or something. Um, and so you can see the entire process as it moves through. It's great. I don't know if you've ever played Minecraft. Um, I dabbled a little bit when I was younger. I was a little um, 
uh, uh, before or I guess after my time for a majority of my video games, but um, tons of people play this. I mean, there's, I think last time, I think I read it was like 130 million or 140 million active users in Minecraft as of 2022, which is just yeah. absolutely nuts. Again, the uh, third party server, the actual game version is called NFT Worlds. And there's a, um, and like a corresponding collection on OpenSea as well. And so, of course, you can go into OpenSea. There's 10,000 different lands that you can purchase. They're all compatible with Minecraft. Um, and yeah, the idea is you can buy the land and then you can take that land and put it into NFT Worlds, into Minecraft, and of course, play with play in it, um, modify it, build in it, play with your friends, etc., cetera, um, and utilize crypto in uh, Minecraft. So like you were saying, Gregory, obviously gaming and blockchains and NFTs all going to be an amalgamation of something beautiful. Um, and this is just another example of, you know, Web3 entering the, the the video game space through Minecraft. Super awesome. Yeah, totally. And, um, you know, it, it's really interesting because we're seeing lots of uh, we're seeing lots of sort of crypto infrastructure um, or, or crypto um aspects of of web3 and crypto kind of all all pushed together right we've got um a an actual cryptocurrency itself an erc20 token that's used uh to purchase things okay we've got actual nfts used to represent non-fungible items in the space so those are already two of crypto's biggest use cases um or, or Web 3.0's biggest use cases, cryptocurrencies and NFTs themselves, and and you know buying and selling with those two things, um, uh, with this game user experience, but also, you know, uh, a huge, huge game community. Like, like Minecraft is massive. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, one of the reasons I'm so excited about blockchain gaming uh, in the first place is it taps into a bunch of people who are already. Uh, kind of hungry for novelty all right which are gamers in the first place they're, they they learn new things quickly um they are powerfully motivated by incentives uh to win and in that case whenever you uh basically make winning look like associated with monetary gain um that's just an extra sort of carrot dangled in front of them uh as, a, as an incentive to jump through the hoop and, and get good at something whether it's collecting uh nfts whether it's earning crypto Whatever it is, that's why I'm so excited about you know gaming uh, with with blockchain and Web 3.0. Um, you also have the culture of Minecraft of like you know kind of like grinding things out and spending the time uh, to to make something and and you know when you when you stack that in with you know earning uh, things that actually have real value and that value is not controlled by the game itself. That that value is actually tradable on the open marketplace, can be withdrawn to a wallet. That's what it makes made possible uh, with crypto. Web through no blockchain, and yeah, I think it's, I think it's really just a matter of time before we see this type of stuff, um, you know, get much bigger than it is today. And it's, you know, we start seeing more and more things like this. Um, you know, we can start to have that snowball, and, and this is something that I think everybody has to understand. Like, you know, <clears throat> technology, how it tends to, um, how it tends to. take off is that it really like it it, it it moves in massive leaps okay so basically how it would and it also it looks kind of like silly when it first comes out in many cases okay um so like whenever the internet first came out like websites they kind of look like toys or, or like early games or something it's like it, you, you kind of even back then, not like not like now looking back, but even then when they first came out, it was sort of like, OK, this is cool. Like, what do you do with it? All right. Unless you unless you had the vision to see the future potential in it, then you didn't recognize how amazing it actually was. That's kind of the same way with blockchain based games right now. A lot of the games don't look like much compared to massive like AAA game studio games. They don't like the aspects of blockchain incorporated into them don't really look that cool on the grand scheme of things. But unless you have the eyes to see the future potential, like you're probably just going to pass it up and say, oh, OK, that's cool. Um, but how this stuff tends to happen is you have these things that look like toys and then 
you know, you start to see more people who are building this and the people who see the future potential who are using it. And that starts to create a snowball. And how, well, how that snowball actually forms into, you know, this uh, massive iceberg thing that can cause an avalanche is it, it, it happens slowly and then really fast. It happens with this massive leap. And then you tend to see um, this sort of hockey stick like event where it just shoots off and actually breaks into, you know, and, and there's no slowing that thing down. Okay. Now, sometimes you see a subsequent like dip and sort of the hype cycle, like where it reaches this point of maximum hype and then you kind of reaches this trough of disillusionment. But then that tends to reach this plateau of productivity and like long term adoption, um, where it's like, it's still, even after the dip, it's like 10 times what it was when it was on the floor back in this phase. And everybody thought it was just a toy and kind of silly. Uh, because even when it reaches that point of maturity where it's like, boom, it's ready to take off, it still doesn't re meet people's expectations, um, but it's still way better than it was when everybody's kind of like, okay, well, it's like smart contracts were the exact same way when they first came out. People are like, oh, this is cool, and we have ICOs, and then we stopped doing stuff with them, and nobody cared about them for two years until DeFi came out and all this other crypto stuff, and then like the world just blew up. And now people are a little bit disillusioned because cryptocurrency prices have gone down. But we're on a huge adoption, uh, you know, cycle, and that's not slowing down anytime soon, in my opinion. That was a really great point. I think you illustrated it really nicely when it came to like technology adoption. Absolutely, that's what it felt like in 2017 with smart contracts. You know, when you first saw them, like, what do you do here? What? Why is this so important? You know, and just a couple of years later, you have DeFi. Um, definitely see the same thing with like blockchain gaming right now. The use cases are mostly kind of small. I've played a couple of games like DeFi Kingdoms, for instance, is basically just glorified DeFi with like, you know, a pixel layer on top of it right now. But there's still right. quests. There's still like, you know, uh, elements of like gaming that are starting to slowly get incorporated. I mean, if we could just fast forward two or three years from now and just see where blockchain gaming is then, you know, you'd be in, right now at this point in history be like, man, I wish I really paid attention to it. So that's how I feel about blockchain gaming just in general. It's just we need to find the right like use case, we need to find the right implementation and then see it executed properly. I've said this before. I think it has something to do with like a free to start model where you're able to start without paying anything and then start acquiring NFTs while you're playing in order to earn some kind of money because that will bring in people that, you know, A, of course, like need a, a job or some source of income, but B, it lets people actually see that like the, the games now are generating value and not just for, of course, the people at the top, the corporations, but generating value for the people themselves, which is the whole, at least in my mind, the way I, you know, frame it. That's the real use case of blockchain gaming. We'll see. Yeah, that's totally. speculative, but that happens. Oof. Yeah, totally. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, we're and we're seeing a convergence of blockchain adoption from every single angle. It's, it's like all the use cases are starting to kind of like, you know, continue to, um, continue to, uh, accrue. Right. And it's sort of like, you got this splatter brush and you're like painting this canvas, but you're not painting it like with this nice paint roller, right. Systematically from top to bottom. It's like, we got all these people, with little tiny paint brushes, like splackling little bits of paint on it. And that eventually has a tipping point to push like the, like the canvas actually falls over on itself on the ground. Right. And then you have this painting. Um, so, like, um, I mean, you got more, more, more evidence that type of that type of stuff. Um, you know, talking about eBay um, and crypto payments. You know, eBay could as soon accept crypto payments. Of course, this is not that big of a stretch because we already have PayPal in the crypto game. Um, you know, we've got uh, Airbnb CEO says they're absolutely looking into crypto payments. Um, so it's like when 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 crypto is now accepted at like every a uh, major place that you could, you know, do spend money online right, for whatever it is, any, ma any mainstream good or service you could pay with crypto. The utility value of cryptocurrencies go up incredibly. Like, they go, like, I, I don't, I don't think you understand, how, like you might understand, but um, I want to highlight how much that sort of long tail effect really matters. Okay. That's, that's, that's the whole benefit of network effect. Like one of the reasons Amazon became so massive is because it became the everything store. Okay. And so like if it, and, and Amazon didn't really have that utility 
as much, okay, until it was the everything store with like two day prime delivery and like sometimes one day, depending on where you live, or even like two hour, right? That's when the value proposition of Amazon skyrocketed. Okay. So similar type of thing with cryptocurrencies. Whenever they finally get that network effect where you can pretty much buy anything with it, like like it that long tail takes a while for it to actually, you know, reach. But once it gets there, the I mean the value proposition is is greatly increased. So uh, to mind that, talking about you know DeFi, uh, all these other use cases, it's just yeah, it's it's crazy. What do you um what do you think about the metaverses right now? Do you have any kind of thoughts about you know these lands? I've I've tried a couple. Um, they're pretty cool, really interesting, especially the ones where the artists tend to congregate and then like to put their works um, on display. I was just wondering if you had any kind of thoughts around them. Yeah, I mean, I think it's in the similar kind of like life like uh similar points life cycle as uh like blockchain gaming where um you know it's still pretty early um we don't know exactly what's going to work with everything i do think it's one of those things where um we'll see something really come out of this that gets big um i don't exactly know what it is there's kind of a lot of question marks here i think that i think that it's it's probably a lot safer to assume that sort of the you know the circles in the Venn diagram you know where they're overlap where they'll eventually overlap I'm not sure but it seems like a stronger bet that metaverse and gaming can have a pretty strong overlap and the stuff that's sort of working in gaming can kind of work in metaverse and vice versa and maybe those maybe those two things maybe the metaverse only ends up you know becoming really a thing for gamers I don't know I don't know the answer to that question right um but to me sort of the user base who would be into blockchain gaming and also in a metaverse there'd be a lot of overlap between those two groups if i had to put money on it yeah no a thousand percent and just for my two cents what i've noticed to your mass adoption point and how we're seeing like ebay and you know all these companies start accepting crypto i feel like that um metaverses are kind of like the the gateway drug in order to get these big companies into um, into crypto for in case in point is um, the sandbox itself has like I, I read this today as like 200 um, active right with you know IRL big corporations big companies um, like yeah. Square Enix just partnered with them for for instance and that's just going to be the the gateway drug if you will or the first instance of them incorporating one of their games into the crypto world and then boom from there the mass adoption occurs um, so that's just my my two cents there yeah totally. Yeah, totally. So let's see here. Uh, Someone says nobody uses eBay <laughs> and says that basically Amazon needs to get uh, with the program and, uh, you know, start accepting crypto. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, e eBay, uh, people do use eBay. It's, it's yeah, obviously nowhere near as big as Amazon. Um, let's see here. Uh, oh, what's going on with Gorley? Anybody knows? Uh, so they might be asking about, uh, I don't know if it's the network itself or the or the faucet. I'm pretty sure that particular test network, people have kind of speculated on whether the Ether itself could have, you know, redeemable value for US dollar. And that for that reason, they were like hoarding it. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't watch it. Basically, when stuff starts breaking on a test network, I just start using a different test network. <laughs> so I don't keep up with a ton of it. Um, luckily, I have... Um, Luckily, my, my team kind of helps me stay on top of what test network has got good faucets at any point in time. Um, so here's a good point. So the problem with trying to say Bitcoin has been a safe haven for many people. Money uh, is Bitcoin is more volatile than any other currency. Bitcoin will have to stabilize then increase value each year. Yeah, it's definitely a good counterpoint, um, you know, to this. But I think... I think part of Bitcoin's appeal is a safe haven is as a safe haven at this price point. Um, at least that's people's perception. Okay. So you think the things in terms of risk reward, right? So um, the risk reward scenario on Bitcoin has changed dramatically over the past three months. Okay. So if you look at, you know, people may not be called Bitcoin a safe haven here at $70,000, uh, but the view of Bitcoin as a safe haven at, you know, thirty. Five thousand dollars, thirty-four thousand dollars, right? Um, might be a different story because 
think about in terms of risk reward what's and and also likelihood like what's the likelihood that bitcoin goes to here i i that likely in my book what's the likelihood that bitcoin goes to here a lot more likely so um i think you know the status of uh safe haven is also dependent upon the current trading price um by the same token like i don't think anybody's going to call gold a safe haven asset if it <laughs> 3x overnight and then you start buying it here like uh, that's not going to happen um so that that's the only counterpoint i'd like to make there so anyways uh that's all i got for today i gotta wrap up i gotta jump off here but uh you know uh, we get we're seeing a lot of stuff kind of change uh, in crypto right now, and um, you know we're, we're seeing lots of people talk about you know Bitcoin. The status of safe haven is changing, even with this crazy stuff that's going on in the world right now. That might think, hey, we want to get away from crypto because we view it as a risky business. Um, well, the view of that could be changing at least for this point in time. Um, that could um, you know really fuel the fire for a, a, another leg up in crypto uh, at some point. Uh, but in the very least, uh, it starts to make the the really bad bear case for crypto less likely, in my opinion. I don't claim to know exactly what's going to happen next, especially not in the short term. Uh, but that's the conversation that's going around, and that's what you need to know. So that's all I got for today. As always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. That really helps the videos out so more people learn about blockchain. And if you're as fascinated with this technology as I am, you want to get your hands dirty, how can you get started today? Well, you go to my YouTube homepage. You can find my free courses there. They're like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those and you want to take the next step, or hey, maybe you want to take a master's shortcut entirely, I should become a blockchain master step-by-step -step start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You don't have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding experience become real-world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. And it's next time. Thanks for watching Dapp University.